Hello, I'm Michael Frederick, Executive Director of the Thorough Society. Welcome to this afternoon's um, panel. Today, we are joined with um, David Gessner and Elise Lemire. This session is sponsored by The Right Connection, a program in partnership with the Thoreau Society and Thoreau Farm. So, Elise Lemire, our first panelist. I am trying to get to her biography. Uh, is the author of Black Walden, Slavery and Its Aftermath in Concord, Massachusetts, as well as more recently, Battle Green Vietnam, the 1971 March on Concord, Lexington, and Boston. A professor of literature at Purchase College, SUNY, she is a two-time recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment of the Humanities and a former board member of the Thoreau Society. I'm going a bit out of order. Elise will speak first, but I do want to introduce David Gessner, is the author of 12 books, including All the Wild That Remains, Edward Abbey, Wallace Stegner, and The American West. Sick of Nature, My Green Manifesto, The Tarball Chronicles, which won the Reed Award for Best Book on Southern Environment and the Asley's Award for Best Book of Creative Writing. Gessner has published essays on, in Outside Magazine and the New York Times Magazine and has won the John Burroughs Award for Best Nature Essay and a Pushcart Prize. Gessner taught environmental writing as a lecturer at Harvard and is currently a professor at the University of North Carolina in, at Wilmington, where he founded the award-winning literary journal of place, Echo Tone. So Elise will be our first presenter and her topic is Battle Green Vietnam. Elise. Thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to share my latest book with the Thoreau Society. I set out to chronicle why American GIs who had recently returned from fighting in Vietnam decided to spend Memorial Day weekend in 1971, marching Paul Revere's midnight route in reverse and camping each night on Revolutionary War battlefields. The route alone told me the veterans were originally intent on ending the war by mobilizing the potent myths and symbols of the nation's 18th century origins in Concord and Lexington. However, I discovered that when they came into contact with local officials intent on keeping the veterans and their political burdens out of sacred spaces frozen at the nation's birth time of 1775, it was the veterans contact with Concord's 19th century history that allowed them to achieve success in, re in reaching the nation's citizenry with their message. And so today's talk is on Thoreau's influence on veteran anti-war activism in Massachusetts. I did ask Mike if I could advance my own slides. So I'm gonna share a screen and hopefully everyone can see this. And someone let me know if you can't. Great. All right. The group that organized the march from Concord to Boston was formed in 1967. Members of Vietnam Veterans Against the War, or VVAW, would don suits and ties and march and give speeches about why they thought the war should end. However, once McCarthy lost the Democratic nomination in 68 and President Nixon failed to live up to his promise of achieving peace, it became clear to anti-war veterans that advocacy and voting were not working. That's when Vietnam veterans against the war turned to theater. Instead of suits, they wore jungle fatigues. Instead of giving speeches, they acted out search and destroy missions during which they took civilian actors captive, interrogated them, and finally shot them dead. 
In the spring of 1971, they decided to stage their brand of performance activism on the nation's most sacred ground. BVAW called the Memorial Day weekend march Operation POW as a means of countering Nixon's assertion that the US must continue to fight in Vietnam until all of the POWs and MIAs were brought home. We are all VBAW countered prisoners of this war. In the flyer they made in advance of the march and distributed along the march route, they aligned themselves not only with Revere, but also with the Lexington militiamen honored in Lexington with the statue you see here, as well as with Ralph Waldo Emerson, citing two verses from his ode sung in the town hall given at a breakfast on July 4th, 1857 to raise funds for improvements to Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Emerson had used the occasion to make a plea for slavery's demise, asking his country to quote, put your creed into your deed, end quote, a message the veterans borrowed. If the nation's creed was liberty and justice for all, then the US should not be fighting a war against Vietnam, a country that cited the US Declaration of Independence and its bid for independence from imperialist invaders. The veterans issued a press release prior to the march explaining that like the Midnight Rider made famous by Longfellow, they saw themselves as patriots bringing a message to the people. The difference was that they used modern means for spreading a modern message. They kicked off the march on Friday afternoon, not with signal lanterns from the Old North Church, but by setting six flares up into the sky over the church. As they explained in their press release, the number represented, quote, one if by land, two if by sea, and three if by air, end quote. Because while Nixon was drawing down American ground troops in 1971, he was escalating the American air war against Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Next, the son of one of the national lancers who had played Revere during a traditional reenactment in the 1950s carried the warning from Charlestown out to Concord in a Land Rover he had outfitted to look like a military chief. He did this while dressed, as you can see in the picture, in his fatigues and a camo covered helmet or rather helmet liner. The helmets were too busy, too, too, uh, too heavy to wear. The 60 or so veterans waiting for him at the Old North Bridge were starting their march in Concord because they were going to reverse Revere's route in an assertion that the nation was traveling away from its founding ideals. Of course, starting a reverse march in Concord meant that they were following the legend and not the historical facts. The real Paul Revere never made it to Concord, but it's the legend that is more widely known and that has created so much national pride. The power of legends would become even more evident later in the march when a legend about Thoreau came to dominate at least one of the veterans' thoughts. The National Park Service had granted BBAW permission for the veterans to eat and camp on Friday night in a field next to the Old North Church and the Minuteman statue, whose face is inscribed with Emerson's words about the shot heard around the world. After a dinner provided them by local Concord supporters and prior to crawling into their sleeping bags, the veterans convened to decide how to handle the fact of the Lexington selectmen refusing their request for permission to carry out mock search and destroy missions in Lexington and to camp on the Lexington Battle Green on Saturday. We have a record of the conversation that ensued because the veterans were followed by several film crews working in concert with them to make a documentary film. So see if you can listen carefully to what each of the veterans is saying here. Maybe we've already done it. We don't want to confront these people. We just want to show them something by our presence, right? Right. So we don't want, and how would these people in their violence, the pigs are the people that start the violence. We're peaceful people. I've had enough of violence I can say for myself. We, we want to stop the war, but we also want to be heard. We want to have an effect. It seems to me that they could come in and say at four in the morning when everybody else is asleep and listening and the sack. They just round us up and, and part us away. No one will see it. Did the people we're marching on this trail uh, 200 years ago, did they have permission of the British if they could do it? Yeah. <laughs> permission to go over there and die. Yeah. 
anybody makes a choice of civil disobedience, it still has to be an individual choice. And that really the only place that we've ever slept illegally is in Vietnam. The only place. <laughs> <I'm right. laughs> okay, all those who are voting for civil disobedience in Lexington, raise your hand. What? I can see if there's any against the Howie. One of the six veterans I follow in the book and who will be my focus today is concerned that an act of civil disobedience will be ineffective if the press doesn't see it. So again, here's what he says, quote, we want to stop the war, but we also want to have an effect. It seems to me that they could come in, say at four in the morning when everybody else is asleep and the newsmen are in the sack and just round us up and cart us away. No one will see it. Now, he's not wrong. Thoreau knew as much, which is why he coupled his jail time with the lecture and eventually an essay about his action. It was the lecture and the essay that made his refusal to pay his tax and his subsequent jail time effectual. The rightly concerned veteran was one of four veterans who voted on Friday night not to commit civil disobedience, not to. Everyone else was persuaded by the veteran who argued that if the colonists were civilly, civilly disobedient, and won the nation's independence, then the veterans would do well to imitate them. Historical reenactment of Revolutionary War battles had just become popular on account of the approaching bicentennial. Reenactors and those who attended reenactments believed that the nation's foundational energy could be re-released through performance at the places where the nation was born. That faith is very much evident in the conversation you just heard. VVAW operated according to majority rule, and the decision was thus made to proceed to Lexington the next day and commit civil disobedience there. On Saturday morning, the veterans made their first stop in Concord's Monument Square, where they had permission from the Concord selectmen to perform one of their mock search and destroy missions. As many of you as many of you know, Monument Square is named for its many monuments and markers, including this one. Henry David Thoreau was imprisoned for one night in a jail on this site, July 1846, for refusing to recognize the right of the state to collect taxes from him in support of slavery, an episode made famous in his essay, Civil Disobedience. Subsequent March events will make clear that memorialization efforts in Concord of the town's 19th century history had an effect on how the veterans perceived their actions. But first, in the grassy expanse at the middle of Monument Square and along the upper portion of Main Street, the veterans did carry out a brutal but mock search and destroy mission this time throwing the civilian actors up against various monuments before summarily murdering them or pretending to murder them. Many of the residents found the level of the veterans commitment to end the war admirable. And when they heard about the Lexington Selectman's decision not to grant the veterans permission to perform and sleep on the battle green, they determined to follow the veterans on foot to Lexington in a show of support for their efforts and to make clear to the veterans that unlike Lexington selectmen, they respected men who had served their country and wanted to hear about the war from those in the best position to report on it. Several hours later, the veterans leading the way to Lexington finally made it to the statue that graced their flyers. Um, VVAW always had the injured lead their protests, as you can see in this picture. Um, basically, that was their way of demonstrating what the Vietnam War had cost them. Operation POW was no different in that respect, and we will see this same wounded veteran in a later photo with the veteran who voted on Friday night against civil disobedience. By the time all of the veterans arrived in the Lexington Battle Green on Saturday afternoon, their numbers had grown to 100 a number that would double again in the coming hours as word spread that the selectmen were continuing to deny men who had served their country access to sacred national ground. At this point, the veteran who had voted against civil disobedience was interviewed on the Lexington Green by one of the film crews who had witnessed him expressing doubts on the night before. As you'll hear, while walking from the Old North Bridge to the Lexington Battle Green and conversing with those locals who followed along to show their support, this veteran's views completely changed. 
I'm a veteran. I served three years in the Marine Corps from 62 to 65. I did not go to Vietnam, I moved to Taiwan for so a while. But I feel morally responsible, just like these men. I spent a total of six years in the service, three years in the reserves after that. And I always sort of persuaded myself that if called, it would be better to obey the order and go to the war zone, commit the evil, than to go to prison. I figured that I couldn't really end the war if I went to prison. And yet maybe if I went to the war zone with the other men, I could somehow relieve the evil. But now I think that's wrong. I think that kind of reason just gets us in deeper and deeper. Yes, Thoreau went to jail for the same issues. There was a war in Mexico in those days. The United States had invaded that country. Thoreau wouldn't pay his tax. They put him in jail. You remember what Emerson said, yeah? Maybe you also know that story. Emerson came into the jail. Here's his good friend, Henry David Thoreau, in the jail. And he said, Henry, why are you here? Henry looked at Ralph Waldo Emerson and said, Ralph, why aren't you here? The men refused to fight, the men refused to serve, the war will stop. So at this point, the veteran no longer mentions his concern that committing civil disobedience with no one to witness it would be ineffectual. Instead, he cites as his inspiration to commit civil disobedience the fact that Thoreau went to jail while Emerson failed to do so. As you know, of course, the story he tells about Emerson visiting Thoreau in jail is apocryphal. It never happened. The imagined conversation between the two men first appeared in print as early as 1865, three years after Thoreau's death, and gained traction in World War I when Emma Goldman repeated it to a jury after being arrested for counseling men to avoid the draft for a war she believed the US was fighting solely for conquest and military power. To make the case that her arrest was a violation of her rights, she recounted a version of this apocryphal conversation between Emerson and Thoreau in jail. I've highlighted the portion of her remarks and it matches in sentiment, but importantly, not word for word what the initially reluctant veteran also cites. So in Goldman's version, Emerson says, David, what are you doing in jail? And she has Thoreau reply, Ralph, what are you doing outside when honest people are in jail for their ideals? In 1969, the imagined exchange was revived by playwrights Jerome Lee and Robert E. Lee in their play, The Night Thoreau Spent in Jail. The play was immediately popular with over 75 college productions in 1970. It continued to be performed widely in 1971 after making its professional debut in Washington, DC. The question for us, of course, is why this conversation between Thoreau and Emerson continued to be imagined and cited and why it was so inspiring to a veteran who less than 24 hours earlier was convinced it was futile to commit civil disobedience when no one was on hand to witness it. Here's the conversation with the accompanying stage directions in the Lawrence and Lee play. This is the version cited by the veteran. Henry, Henry, what are you doing in jail? Waldo, what are you doing out of jail? If the veteran can remember the words so precisely, that's because the playwrights have taken the anaphora in Goldman's account where the beginning of phrases match and thus Emerson's question, what are you doing in jail is met with, what are you doing outside when honest people are in jail for their ideals? And they've added apostrophe where the ends of phrases are matched as well. And they've thereby created an example of simplicity. In other words, the playwrights used a powerful rhetorical device to highlight the contrast between two different options, namely doing something and doing nothing to right a wrong, whether the wrong was slavery as in Henry's day or the wrong of the Vietnam War in the playwright's day. The playwrights actually double down on the power of rhetorical effects when they turn Emerson's question into Henry's rhetorical question. In other words, Henry never answers Emerson's question. He doesn't explain that he's in jail because he withheld his poll tax in protest of the expansion of slavery. Rather, he asks Emerson to turn the question on himself, for which the only answer can be that Emerson is hoarding freedom for himself and in doing so is perpetuating the enslavement of others 
For the veteran interviewed on the green, the rhetorical effects have thus not only aided memory, but prompted his own introspection. The result is a new conclusion for him. If men do something, namely refuse to fight the Vietnam War, change will be affected. The war will end. After another dinner provided them by local supporters, the veterans were served with an injunction from the Lexington selectmen that would ensure the selectmen had the right to not merely fine the veterans for violating a bylaw, but also to arrest them and charge them with a crime that would have to be tried in Massachusetts Superior Court. Faced with what would be a far stiffer penalty for committing civil disobedience and aware that there would be real consequences in terms of seeking employment or getting into grad school, the veterans immediately had another one of their inclusive discussions and then took another vote about what to do. This time, the vote was unanimous. The four veterans who had voted against civil disobedience had changed their minds, eager to proceed now that they understood their stand as a, rep as a repetition of Thoreau's. The hundreds of civilians who stayed to get arrested with them in what would become and remains the largest mass arrest in the state's history cited the same motivation. One remarked, quote, this is the only chance in my life I'll have to imitate Thoreau and take this dare to be civilly disobedient. In waiting until 2 a.m. to order the mass arrest, the Lexington selectmen did just as the initially concerned veteran had anticipated, but for a different reason. There were over 1,000 people crowded onto the tiny green, and the town had no place to jail all of them, and thus waited until dropping temperatures sent some people home to their warm beds. The press, however, never left and, and was thus still on hand when police from three towns with state police as backup moved in and spent two hours loading protesters onto buses and transporting them to the town garage, which had been cleared of equipment so it could be used as a makeshift jail. Even despite some of the protesters having gone home, over 400 people were arrested in total before the makeshift jail was declared full and the police stopped arresting people, even as many begged to be included. The police also refused to arrest wounded veterans, sensing that to do so would have been a publicity nightmare. This photograph shows the initially reluctant veteran and his wife walking towards the police with the wounded veteran we saw earlier to insist that he be given his chance to imitate Thoreau. When the police refused, the veteran and his wife were forced to go to jail without him. One wounded veteran who we'll see in the next slide was so determined to get arrested, he used his prosthetic legs to pull himself out of his wheelchair and onto the bus. The selectmen never did enforce the injunction. Rather, the protesters were arrested on the charge of disorderly conduct, and thus they were not tried in superior court as they had feared, but they were tried in Middlesex District Court on a Sunday morning which was located in the Concord townhouse then, the same building in Monument Square in which the Emerson Ode, the veterans quoted, was initially sung. Here on the left, you see the protesters striking the POW pose of their march's name as they enter court. You can see the initially reluctant veteran's wife having already been tried and fined applauding them. On the right, you see the veteran who had lost both of his legs in Vietnam, exiting on his two prosthetic legs after being tried, this photograph would run in newspapers around the country, a reproach to the Lexington selectmen for treating a grievously wounded man so poorly, as well as a reproach to the Nixon administration, which thereafter was unable to further escalate the air war it was, it was waging in Southeast Asia. I don't know if anyone commented on the fact that the protesters were tried within, at, within yards of where Thoreau was jailed and in a building for which Thoreau surveyed the lot, and in which he gave his lecture, The Martyrdom of John Brown. But later interviews with local participants make clear that Thoreau was on their mind, not as a theorist of civil disobedience, but as someone who had practiced it in the same area where the veterans took their stand. One local explained of her decision to get arrested, quote, if dissent in of all places, Lexington, right next to the birthplace of Thoreau, was going to be snuffed out, we would lose all of our freedom. After the march, which was on the front page of regional newspapers for four days in a row and covered across the country, the initially reluctant veteran and his wife became convinced that Thoreau's methods were efficacious and thus continued to follow his lead. She silkscreened the 1856 Maxim daguerreotype of Thoreau 
onto federal 1040 tax forms, along with a quote from Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience, quote, if a thousand men were not to pay their tax bills this year, that would not be as violent and bloody a measure as it would be to pay them and enable the state to commit violence and shed innocent blood, end quote. Those who use this 1040 form decline to pay the percentage of the federal, decline to pay that percentage of their tax that match the percentage of the federal budget allocated to the Vietnam War. They send that portion of their tax bill to the Roxbury War Tax Scholarship Fund, the name and address of which are at the bottom of the form. The fund was held at the Black-owned Unity Bank in Roxbury, then a predominantly Black and impoverished part of Boston. Contributors met twice yearly to designate a recipient for the interest on the account. In 1969, for example, the interest was used to pay for hot lunches at the Highland Park Free School, a Roxbury controlled school. Thoreau's role in the anti-war activism of Vietnam veterans is another of the many parts he has played in world history. Certainly in the spring of 1971, it was the opportunity to reenact Concord's history and particularly Thoreau's actions that gave the anti-war protesters the courage of their convictions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elise, for that enlightening talk on your new book, Battle Green. Uh, next up, we have David Gessner. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay, Michael? Yes. All right. Well, this is round three with the Thorough Society, and I'm going to kind of spin things more toward Elisa's great talk and civil disobedience today. Um, I'll give you an overview first of the book, but um, I will say that my past two talks, one with the right connection and one with the society itself, were my more challenging talks. I likened it to the more difficult questions on Jeopardy, some of the Q and A's I got. And I did lapse a little during my book tour. I'm out West right now in Utah. And I've been saying thorough, I mean, I've been saying thorough, but I'm back to saying thorough today. So um, let me just react to a couple things that Elise uh, talked about right off the bat. Um, some of us who are on the uh, thorough website or the uh, Facebook page know that we've been talking about Catherine Schultz who wrote Pawn Scum, which was the New Yorker attack on uh, Thoreau a few years ago, and coincidentally had something come out this week. Uh, and I was thinking about a quote from Laura Walls in her great biography, which is Thoreau didn't go to the woods to escape reality, but to confront it. And that's something I'm gonna circle back to the ways that he confronted it. Uh, I'm gonna read uh, my book, follows the year around um, the, the pandemic year. And this is the beginning of a, one of the sections in June. I've noticed that during the pandemic, Henry's hairstyle has come back into vogue. Men wearing beards and looking generally Amish. We live more like novelists now, more focused on our own internal imaginative worlds, our homebound obsessions. We are lucky if those obsessions merit being obsessed over. But as so often happens, a movement in one direction spurs its opposite. Having spent so much time in our houses, we now pour out of them. In this too, we are following thorough. The streets of our country overflow with resistors. These protesters are practicing, whether they call it this or not, civil disobedience. And despite what some say, it is overwhelmingly civil. There are those who have given Thoreau too much credit for his essay, Resistance to Civil Government, better known as civil disobedience. There are those who have given him too little. So um, I would say that in that, when I'm talking about internal imaginative worlds, uh, Emerson might play that role in that interaction, that imagined interaction. And in writers, and particularly in Thoreau, we have that kind of internal conflict, the, the need to retreat into oneself, because that's where art is created, right, often but then the need to bring it back to the world. And obviously uh, Thoreau did that and I'll, I'll circle back to that. But first I'm gonna tell you a tiny bit about the book. Um, the publicity material for the book basically say, uh, when the pandemic started, nature writer, a term I've never been very fond of, nature writer David Gessner 
uh, turned to Thoreau. Uh, it was I was still calling him Thoreau back then. Can't shake it. Uh, and that was not entirely true. Through a strange turn of events, the writing cabin I built myself on a salt marsh in North Carolina on my 50th birthday had washed away during Hurricane Florence uh, down in North Carolina. And I'd started to build it back up again and shingle it, cedar shingle it to remind me of Cape Cod in January before the pandemic. And just coincidentally, I started to read the Laura Walls biography. And then I got excited about building and I built an Osprey platform. So I was really geared to thinking about Henry uh, well before the pandemic started. And then like a lot of us, uh, I did, I mean, there was a really funny McSweeney's piece, which we can talk about a little later, which was uh, Thoreau talking smack to English professors who'd given him flack for going home and doing his laundry uh, and saying, look who's, la who's laughing now, right? Because it just seems such an obvious thing. The first, uh, the first lessons that we were all talking about was kind of learning our backyards. I've traveled a good deal in Concord. And for me, I had been department chair for five years in my creative writing department at the university. And I said it was like playing space invaders and shooting down incoming emails and phone calls and zings and zangs and a very unsimple life. And suddenly I was freed of that. So I made a study of the fiddler crabs down by my shack on the, on the salt marsh. And then of the clapper rails who seemed to me to really embody what I just described about Emerson and the novelist artist side and the activist side. Clapper rails are like little artists. They they're look kind of like pudgy birds, but they that's where the phrase thin as a rail comes from. They can hide between the grasses and follow the pathways of mice. And they make their living by hiding, uh, which, is, which is amazing because then at about cocktail hour, they go off like car alarms and they're the loudest birds in the world. And they move, if you've ever seen the scene in Lord of the Rings where the beacons get lit and move from Gondor to Rohan or wherever it is, the noise moves down the marsh and it's deafening and you can get it going by actually clapping. So I wrote to another Concord resident, uh, David Sibley and said, what's the deal? How can a bird that's evolved by making, by making its living hiding suddenly reveal its place? And he gave some smart answer that I can't remember but I take a more, more metaphoric answer. I say that's like the artist, right? You hide out in your shack and your place apart. And then when you're ready, you burst forth and, and sing your song. And I don't know if it's pronounced crutch or crooch. Somebody can um, put that in the Q and A or chat, but that was one of the first books I read when I was young, Joseph Wood Crooch, Crutch. And it was so fascinating to see those different parts of Thoreau. And one of the critiques in the, um, the Catherine Schultz piece is that he's, you know, he's turning away, he's turning away from the world. And what I think of is the artist goes away from the world to create a gift, to create something that they then bring back to the world. And, uh, and to me, he, he's the perfect embodiment of that. Um, and I'll get back to that. But let me just give you a kind of an overview of the book. Uh, so I started to write these essays right away with the pandemic. And I wrote them on the heels of experience throughout the pandemic. I published an early essay in American Scholar that got a pretty strong reaction. And then it got into my head to write a book. Um, a lot of it came from my journals and a lot of that came from Henry. So I'll just read the first couple paragraphs of the book to give you a sense of it, then describe it and then hurry back to civil disobedience. 16 years ago, when our daughter was just a baby, my wife and I took a trip to Walden Pond. As we approached the place where Henry David Thoreau's cabin once stood, with my daughter riding up on my shoulders, I said to her, that's where the man lived who ruined your father's life. Ruined in a good way, I meant. I discovered Walden when I was 16 and never quite recovered. I began to question the values of the system in which I found myself. The life that men praise and call successful is but one kind, Thoreau wrote. And I hollered, amen. In this way, Thoreau was like a more profound, less musical version of getting stoned and listening to Pink Floyd, but the effect was more lasting. 
I began to keep a journal in high school and I keep one to this day. After college, the sentences from Thoreau's book were still rippling outward through my life, affecting the choices I made. To hell with law school or any normal career. I would become a writer, I would value solitude, and I would move to my very own Walden, which happened to be Cape Cod, but that's another story. I've been thinking about Thoreau, Thoreau as COVID-19 sweeps across the country, the obvious stuff, he was America's original social distancer, a cliche, and the not so obvious. Thoreau can serve as a model of self-reliance, reminding us that pulling back from the world, which at the moment will save lives, has its less dramatic virtues. Having long been a corrective to our compulsive national habits of over busyness and consumption, he can inspire just such a corrective now, but only if we try to dig below the cliche of him. Because as it happens, Thoreau was not all flowers and acorns. And this man who died at 42 had some profound and sturdy thoughts, not just about nature, but about death and disaster. There will come a time soon after the pandemic has subsided when we will be trying to make sense of what has happened, when we tell a story about where we are and where we are going and about how we have changed. For me, at least, Thoreau's ideas will be part of that story. So I wrote that early on and then I kept going. And I wanna talk about the journals for a second. Uh, one of the themes of the book, which is kind of contained in that, the life that men praise and call successful is but one kind was I was a driven Massachusetts kid who you know, tried to do well in school. And I really am serious. That one book derailed me to some extent. But as an example of why the less successful worldly side can sometimes ultimately uh, have, be more fruitful, I tried to write these novels in my 20s that were quite stilted and unpublishable and characters would quote Thoreau to each other. Um, but at the same time, I began to keep, keep journals obsessively. And I now have about 62 of them uh, from the time I was 16 until now when I'm 60. Uh, and as these novels were going nowhere in the world, uh, the journals were growing. And when I finally did get around to publishing my first book, it wasn't fiction, it wasn't a novel. It was uh, writing in what I called my journal voice. And I always said that the failure of those early books and the development of the journal was almost like nurse logs in the forest. And the, the new growth that came out of it was my new writing, which was predominantly nonfiction and direct and, and in my own voice. In the same way, I felt like my writing shack provided a counter life to the busy writing and professorial work I did in the morning, slamming things out to deadline and trying to get things done. And then in the evening, I'd go down beer in hand to the shack I'd built myself that looked out over the marsh. And I'd bird watch, read by inclination, jumping around, scribble things down in the journal. And a lot of my best sentences and, and words ended up coming from there. So uh, the, the first two chapters of this book and what I did, what I ended up at my publisher's suggestion is it starts with COVID deaths at the beginning of each month and startlingly small at first, right? The first March, it's 2,700 deaths or something like that. And so the first chapter goes into that kind of learning your backyard and phenology, one of my favorite words, which is, as most people here know, the phenomenon of the year, the, the art of kind of watching that phenomenon, when things bud, when migration, when birds migrate. And what I found was that first month when supposedly we were isolated was the opposite of isolation in many ways because I began to watch the migration back of these black skimmers on our beach nearby and of um, the terns returning. And it felt like a connective to the world. Um, and studying phenology, which has always been kind of exciting to me, was obviously something that Thoreau was a master of. We know that his journal notes are still being used by climate scientists to find out when things flower and conquered. So that was the first chapter. Very personal, right? Very internal. Um, the second chapter was about rewilding. And I'd re written a book about Roosevelt that had come out a year before. I think it's over there on my shoulder. And one of the things that I thrilled to was the idea of rewilding Yellowstone to Yukon, this project, the Y2Y, where they had created overpasses and underpasses for large carnivores to migrate on. And suddenly we were seeing that on our screens, right? We all saw 
uh, pe villages where they were seeing the Himalayas for the first time because the air had cleared. And my personal favorite, which was uh, seeing, I used to live in Boulder, Colorado, and seeing the mountain lions stroll down Main Street during a snowstorm. And there was something thrilling, you know, that's why Savage Delight is in my, the famous woodchuck line um, uh, is in my title. And then I was sent back where I had to go back to school. I was the chair of the department and the only one there. And I felt like I was in this post-apocalyptic kind of Will Smith situation. And one day somebody knocked on the door and I jumped because no one was around. I had the, the whole place to myself and it was a campus cop. And we started to talk and she said, oh my God, you should see this place at night. Deer are walking down Chancellor's Walk and uh, deer, I mean, coyotes are walking down Chancellor's Walk and deer are nibbling at the rec center. So there was this kind of feeling. And I reached out to a lot of scientists to ask if this was going to create more of a permanent helpful change in terms of climate. And sadly, the answer I got was no, taking a time out for two months is not going to do the trick. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that. So anyway, I followed the year. And strangely, uh, Henry was a great guide where uh, suddenly, and I'm getting to kind of what I wanted to talk about with Elise. And Michael, if you want to, I did, you know, as you can tell, I did not write a talk per se, so I'm not timed out. So you can jump in and say, let's go to Q and A's because I'd really like to have a discussion. But then in June, how strange that this very internal year started to turn on Black Lives Matters marches and uh, being out in the streets after we'd been at home. Uh, again, so Thoreauvian in terms of uh, both opposite poles. So. My daughter, who's 18, seems to have an activist gene that I lack. Uh, my, it's been a long struggle to try to uh, be an activist other than in my books. I'm in Utah right now in Edward Abbey Company. And as many of you know, uh, Abbey's one of the great, along with Annie Dillard, is one of the great modernizers of the cabin in the woods uh, archetype. And Abbey said, one brave act is worth a thousand world, words, words, excuse me. And I've always felt accused by that because my activism skill tends to be in writing these things. And it's more that novelistic internal thing, but I've tried to push myself outward. And one reason I've done that and one way I've done that is through seeing that in my students, um, great, thanks Michael. In my students, climate change you know, I went to class, one of the essays in, is in here is about my classmate, Bill McKibben, who I worked with on the Harvard Crimson. I was the political cartoonist who drew like a trickle down theory, a drawing of Reagan from the back urinating on a bum in the gutter. And he was the one who protected me when the conservatives attacked me. But for me, when End of Nature came out, I was, you know, learned late about climate, right? That was, what is that, 25 years ago now or something. And it was always a little theoretical, but seeing in my daughter, and of my students, the true anxiety that climate caused, it was like the, the old USSR uh, bomb scares, you know, under the desk, uh, really kind of brought me alive and, so, and made me vow to be more activist. And of course, in that way too, I was following Henry. So this fascination for me in the book is with how I would be listening to uh, how it was the most internal and external world, uh, word, world that, um, for the rest of the year, starting in June, where I'd be listening to those bird calls down in the shack and I'd come back and hear CNN. Because of course it's an election year too. And it almost felt like we had no skin there for a while between the two crises. Um, so I thought I would read, I know that most of you know um, the influence that Thoreau had on both Gandhi and Martin Luther King, but in, contrast to those who say, oh, he ran away from the world and he didn't face ugly realities. I weave together uh, his, um, Thoreau's influence with, uh, with what is going on in the world during the pandemic. And I'll just read, because it's so powerful. I'm just going to read the one paragraph from Martin Luther King's autobiography. And maybe I'll stop there and, and say the rest during a, during a conversation. King wrote, I became convinced that non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. 
No other person has been more eloquent and passionate in getting this idea across than Henry David Thoreau. As a result of his writings and personal witness, we are the heirs of a legacy of creative protest, like the one at least just described. The teachings of Thoreau came alive in our civil rights movement. Indeed, they are more alive than ever before. Whether expressed in a sit-in at lunch counters, a freedom ride into Mississippi, a peaceful protest in Albany, Georgia, a bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, these are outgrowths of Thoreau's insistence that evil must be resisted and that no moral man can patiently adjust to injustice. So um, the, the next chapter, on, since we just went through July 4th and those of us were, with pets were full of chagrin, begins, we can see the two Thoreaus on two 4th of Julys. On July 4, 1854, Thoreau joined abolitionist Sojourner, Sojourner Truth and William Lloyd Garrison for a rally to protest slavery in Framingham, Massachusetts. This is the rally where Thoreau stood under a black draped American flag hung upside down and where Garrison burned copies of the Fugitive Slave Act and the US Constitution. On the same day, nine years earlier, Thoreau had celebrated his independence by moving to his cabin on Walden Pond. And when I go in a more writerly route on this, I talk about how the move to the cabin was, among other things, a very practical solution to the artist problem of poverty and also uh, getting your writing done. Uh, but here, I want to keep the focus more on that outward aspect. I'll say one other thing is that during the fall, as the election heated up, um, I had a neighbor who voted for somebody other than who I voted for. I'll leave it at that. And um, he was one of the few people I saw directly since we were isolating. And uh, after the day after the election, he left a six pack of IPA on my doorstep with a note that said, to the victor go the spoils, reaching out from the other side of the divide. Another classmate of mine, Jamie Raskin, ended up leading uh, the impeachment hearings. So it was a year in which I felt never before uh, the political the external was tied to the personal and the internal. And I hope we can get some fun questions and uh, and get a little civil disobedience chat going. So thank you. Thank you, David. And David just presented on his book, Quiet Desperation, Savage Delight. And um, of course, Elise's book, Battle Green Vietnam. And uh, please send your questions in for um, David and Elise using the Q&A feature. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, in terms of, um, and this has come up in other panels, um, how do you see um, nature writing and protest writing working together um, in Thoreau's Thoreau's writings. In other words, is he able to combine these two, or do you see them as separate and distinct? I, can I first say one thing that I was just struck by um, in David's fabulous remarks? Um, and you mentioned, David, that you're a classmate of Bill McKibben, uh, who wrote The End of Nature and a, a wonderful book on only having one child, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think we all know how important he has been, but I, I wanted to just um, direct people to a piece he wrote in Mother Jones. It's on his website. And Bill McKibben talks about where he got his start as an activist. And you won't believe this, but his dad got arrested with the Vietnam veterans on the Lexington Battle Green. The kids went home after a, after a time. Uh, many children did get arrested, um, but Bill McKibben himself was with his dad on the green and then did go home, but has said that that seeing the veterans mobilize his father, who was not a protester, to stand with them and get arrested with them was the beginning of his life as an environmental activist. I just wanted to put that out there as something that is a partial answer to your question, Michael, but also just sort of a fabulous connection, um, a kind of through line from Thoreau to the Vietnam veterans to, to Bill McKibben and all that that means. So. That's great. Um, and it's interesting to see those early influences. Uh, Jamie Raskin's father was a, was a huge influence on him in that way. I think I'm gonna answer your question in a little different way, Michael, where from a writerly point of view, if 
those two, if those things were separate, like you say, if they were separate modes, uh, he wouldn't be nearly as interesting a writer to me. Part of the reason he is a fascinating writer, uh, uh, separate from politics or identifying butterflies or anything, is that these contrary nuggety things are all mixed together. And that a sentence about throttling woodchuck can be followed by a beautific sentence, can be followed by a political sentence. And I think to go back, is it Crutch or Crutch, by the way? Somebody tell me. I don't, anyway, one of the things he said, those contradictory parts are the phenomenon known as Henry David Thoreau. So in other words, if you didn't have the, like for instance, I mentioned Desert Solitaire and Edward Abbey, which in their own way is a, you know, fart laden, swear laden updating of, of Walden, right? And he's got a moment, which is a lot like the Woodchuck one, where he picks up a rock and it's gonna bean a rabbit. Mm -hmm. uh, followed by very beautiful passages. And for me, from a right, as a writer, that's the interesting thing. So you can separate them out. You know, some people are gonna put them on their, their activism flag. Some people are gonna put them on their nature, their solitude flag, their, their monk-like flag, but it's more interesting that he's all bound together for me. So I wouldn't even have been drawn to him if I didn't have that complexity. And I would say dogmatism is the enemy these days, saying emphatically, this is the way it is. And it's so interesting that this guy that Gandhi and Martin Luther King point to also hates do-gooders, right? <laughs> he, 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 you know, he doesn't want to do good. It's that we're, so it's, that's what's interesting to me is the whole wild mix of it. Hmm. Yes, and, and Gandhi speaks of reading not only um, civil disobedience, but also Walden and particularly um, walking that he recommends to his hmm friends and followers as a magnificent um, essay to read. Um, Elise, really, um, how much in the consciousness uh, of the public do you think this 1971 March really was until this, until your book? Well, if you go to the Wikipedia page for Vietnam Veterans Against the War, which is still an active, active um, organization, um, well, if you've gone to it a couple years ago, Operation POW was really, you know, a sentence. And if you read the two considered the two books that are considered the definitive histories of the organization, Operation POW is not included, which is why I decided to write the book. And I'm really happy to say that I got a lovely letter from VVAW's board saying how much they appreciated the book and it's really helping them to rechart their sense of when and where VVAW had its biggest impact. And it used to be, and I think, I think this is fair to say, but I'm, I'm obviously biased, that the pinnacle of VVAW's um, activism and impact was when they occupied Washington DC for five days. Of course, that's where John Kerry gave his famous speech to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It's where the veterans threw away their medals, et cetera, et cetera. That's when v VVAW burst onto the national stage and had the national spotlight. Um, but I, I would argue that um, Operation POW is, in fact, really the quintessential BVAW um, weekend of performance activism. It includes all the ingredients of their prior successful events, but takes them to a new level. Uh, this, I, I said that this event was covered nationally. It was also in the international press. So my hope is now that people will realize it, it had an incredible, it had an incredible impact. Um, and obviously today's talk was just a tiny fragment of my book, the same as David's was just a fragment of a longer, wonderful book. Um, but uh, VVAW, this particular event, because it ended up being a reproach of how Revolutionary War battlefields are memorialized in Massachusetts, where violence is completely taken out of the landscape and out of all of the myths. Um, Vietnam Veterans Against the War re-injected the story of violence into those landscapes. And, and you see that when you go to Washington, DC. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial is this, it's a scar in the national body that is the memorialized land of the National Mall. So they had an impact, this particular operation, right? It's a reproach to Nixon and Ross Perot and all those guys, and that was effective. And it was a turning point in how war was memorialized as evidenced by the wall. 
Um, we've since, unfortunately, turned back to more, you know, representational statuary um, and to soaring obelisks. You just can look at the World War II Memorial or the Korean Memorial in DC to see that. So I think it's a problem that we've forgotten Operation POW. And I think it needs to be remembered because it was impactful. I mean, not only did so many people get arrested, fine, but it, that picture of Phil Lavoie, I didn't mention any veterans names today on purpose because I didn't want a little snippet of their role in the march to be associated with their names if you wanna read more about them. I cover six veterans in the book and I try to tell it in a really novelistic way so that you're on the ground moving through the memorialized landscape with them and encountering officials and figuring out what to do. But um, that picture of Philip Lavoie who recently passed away um, just, just, just very recently, him descending the steps on two prosthetic legs, that I was able to find that in newspapers throughout the country. So it wasn't widely known as evidenced by the fact that a lot of my Concord friends had not heard of it. Right. Um, but uh, it, it was big, it was impactful. It launched John Kerry's career, he was arrested. Um, you know, it, it helped launch Bill McKibben's activist career there. Noam Chomsky was there. I should be quiet because I could go on and on about how, how important I think it was. And I don't think we've wrestled yet with Thoreau's role at that moment in time because we're so used to thinking of him as really impactful in the civil rights movement. Uh, can I um, read a short passage from my book relevant to what Elise was just saying? Do we have time for that? It's just a couple paragraphs. Yes, okay. And we do have just under five minutes to go. Um, well, this is a this is a um, protest in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I live. Where in 1898, essentially the white minority overthrew the black majority. So there was a fraught history downtown, and my daughter was part of a high school group downtown, uh, protesting. While the kids chanted and marched and listened to speeches. I lurked on the other side of the street. I felt like a secret service agent, though to others I might have looked like someone a secret service agent should have been watching out for, long haired, bearded, wearing a mask, eyes scanning the crowd. At one point, a character even more suspicious than me showed up, a scraggly, scowly faced man who rode an ancient ram horn 10 speed bike through the bank parking lot across the street from City Hall. The man paused on the bike and began to scream, shut the fuck up, over and over at the kids. I, move, I moved closer to him, and so did one of the cops stationed near the rally, who was not incidentally African-American. You're going to mace me, he said. I got a fucking gun. Luckily, he didn't. And after the cop approached and had talked to him a while, he petulantly rode away. I backed off but stayed vigilant. Hadley made it safely through the afternoon, and the most anyone in her group suffered was a minor heat stroke. Compared to those being shot with rubber bullets or knocked to the ground by cops, they suffered little. And compared to the victims like George Floyd, who had spurred the protest, they suffered not at all. But there was a risk. There is always a risk. That is the math of protest. What are we willing to give up to try and affect the change we want? Are we willing to sacrifice our private pleasure for the public good? Are we willing to interrupt our oh so precious lives? It is dangerous business leaving the woods behind. It is scary out in the streets. Of course, it is more complicated than that. In at least one case, the ideas that inspire those on the streets were born in the woods. I, I know we have literally one second left. I just want to jump in and say, I really appreciate you closing that way because so much of what happened in the weekend I chronicle was the fear of another Chicago. And the, the, the wider discussion about Thoreau that weekend was about the importance of being peaceable um, and how the veterans had to train the townspeople to ensure that everyone would act in a way that would be least likely to draw police brutality. So yeah, there's always a risk. And that was very much in play in the event that I recount as well. So thank you for finishing with that. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, David. Thank, thank you. And you, thank you both for writing two very relevant books um, for our time, both of them in terms of the in terms of protest, in terms of Black Lives Matter and David's book, um, really timely. So that's our time for today. Thank you for joining us. And there's more to come this afternoon as we move to George 
uh, Shaler next. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.